Trish. Uh, thanks for joining me in this inaugural video for instructional currents that I'm going to be doing over Zoom. I'd like to talk to people about um, some narrowly focused instructional development topics, tools, or techniques. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about, uh, well, you wrote something recently and, I, and I'm going to read it off here, but uh, this intrigued me because I thought, well, this has implications to management in a learning and development, training and development, learning uh, experience design uh, function. But you wrote, private companies may now find they must also disclose human capital management metrics to their bank, uh, VC, et cetera, the next time they try to secure financing or go for funding. Banks and other lenders, private equity, et cetera, are all starting to require insights into people management and development practices too. If value creation comes from people, and it does, then it's time people were part of the analysis of anticipated organizational performance. So I re that really uh, struck me. This was the second time I, I saw you write about that. Uh, and, and then you write, it's a brave new world. So that led me to formulate three questions that I thought this video would focus on. And I shared those with you and you said, but wait, there's this background. So. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to say, well, where does this come from that, that's, that may require or does require uh, companies to start reporting out on their uh, management uh, or their development of people practices? Yeah, it's great. And Guy, thanks so much for, for having me and inviting me to this conversation. You talked about the quote there that you um, saw from whatever social media channel that we both follow each other on. Mm -hmm. but. And in the quote, you're talking about how I mentioned about private companies, but part of what's driving this is that public companies that operate in the United States, according to the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, actually are required to start reporting as of Monday, as of, so Monday is November the 9th. Okay. Um, and so, so I think the zooming out, right? So if we use that framework from ISPI about the four W's and we start with just really that meta context, like where is this coming from and, and what does it mean? And then, so how do we go from what's happening in the world all the way down to what's happening with work and, and workers? And then what does that mean to learning and performance and to, to people that have practices within the learning function? Mm -hmm. So, this actually all started, um, it started with the United Nations back in 2015. And I, I have kind of a, a personal story, which I'm, I'm gonna table for a second, but the United Nations actually got a whole bunch of world leaders together. They got a bunch of organizations from different sectors together. So for profits, not for profits, NGOs and all the rest of it. And they got together and they decided we need a new roadmap. We need a new agenda for how it is that we're going to come together globally in order to write some things in the world that up until now we hadn't had the technology or the insights or the data to be able to really be able to apply human ingenuity to addressing. And what came out of that meeting was the United Nations then published the 17 Sustain, sustainability development goals. So a lot of people call them the SDGs. And basically what it is, is it's the 17 like really big, like BHAG, right? Like moonshot kind of objectives, ending hunger, right? Ending, you know, waterborne disease. Like, I mean, like really big stuff. And that concrete measurable progress toward that end and actually meeting those objectives, meeting all 17 of those goals by the year 2030. So uh, what happened in 2015 when they first published the 17 SDGs, the sustainab sustainability development goals, is that about 190 plus countries actually adopted them almost immediately. So if we think about, you've got the United Nations and you've got countries that adopted these goals. Now, why would countries adopt these goals? Well, because countries compete on talent and citizens, on talent and taxes, right? So if you're a country and you don't 
provide opportunity to the people that come and work in the country or come and live and work in the country, then you can't sustain the revenue that you need from things like taxes or consumer or you know so on and so forth. So there's a competition element there. And if you think back to like 2015, we had a lot that was going on around like, we suddenly had like meeting space and meeting venues. So instead of doing your like leadership meeting as an example, you know, if you're a global multinational company, instead of doing your leadership meeting in like Chicago at McCormick, like why not go to Dubai? Why not go to, you know, Santon to go to, you know, South Africa? Um, and so you started having like this competition for again, attracting people to come, to come, to come. You also have things like, we often think about big events, like why do countries, like why do countries and cities compete to host events like the Olympics? Like what is the economic opportunity? What is the reputational opportunity for doing those types of things? And so like we've got the Olympics that was supposed to happen in Japan this year that's now been deferred to next year. We've got World Expo, which is happening in Dubai, which is kind of like a play off of the World's Fair. And we were just talking about the Museum of Science and Industry here in Chicago, which is, of course, that campus came up from the World's Fair in Chicago. But countries compete to host those events because, again, there's economic opportunity. And that means you have to be able to attract people, tourism, you have to be able to attract talent and then you have to be able to provide for your citizens. So when you talk about when we look at like the 17 UN sustainability development goals, countries adopted it and it has to do with really you can take the 17 goals and you can break them into what are the environmental concerns, what are the social concerns and then what are the government concerns. So then countries took the goals and they said okay as a country we're going to align to out of the 17, right? Here are the priorities that we're gonna do over this period of time. And then here's our national strategy, our national agenda for how to get there, which is kind of crazy being an American because in the US, we don't really have that. Like there's no like website where right. you go and look at the US's alignment to the sustainability goals, but you can do that for other countries. like. If you go out and take a look at the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, like they've had the agenda for 2021 and then they had it for now they have it for 2030. And so because of the work that I do globally, I had visibility into this kind of alignment. So um, so you've got these now national goals, right? So global goals breaking down into national goals. Well, how are nations going to reach this? Well, they need organizations, right? So again, pro, you know, for-profit, non-profit, NGOs, they need them to have that kind of strategic alignment to the national goals, which have the alignment to the global goals. And so now this is why, like here in the United States, we hear about companies talking about, you know, all these um, either social practices or environmental practices. So like, as an example, before, various crises came into play this year, I was actually supposed to keynote a conference down in Sydney, Australia. And as a consumer, like I made a choice to book on Delta Airlines because Delta was starting to go to net carbon zero starting in March of this year. So let me pause there for a moment. And I, I'm gonna ask you guys, so have you ever made like a decision on an organization that you, a brand that you were going to interact with because of? Social responsibility. Yes. If I felt that they were uh, uh, doing something where their competitors weren't, and that was clear to me, I always kind of, you know, go that way over price. And that, well, exactly. And then the flip of that is what if it's an organization that didn't, share the same values as you do or was not taking social responsibility. Right. We, we tend to abandon doing business with those organizations or avoid doing business. And we also don't invest. We don't want our mutual funds. We don't want our pensions. We don't want our 401ks. Like we don't want our money in any kind of shape or form to go to those organizations who we don't think are acting responsibly. 
So that's how you go from national goals into these organizations. And that's why we're seeing so much conversation around essentially what is environment, social, and government. So about two years ago, about in 2018, organizations for that reason, because they're external con constituents, us, as investors, as shareholders, as consumers, started really putting pressure on organizations to act in a way beyond just profitability. And because of that, a couple of things happened. The first thing that happened is the business roundtable, which has been like one of the one of the really big influencers, especially in the United States, that kind of um, has driven corporate philosophy. They're the ones in the 1990s that picked up on a theme, Milton Friedman's theme from the 1980s, that the purpose of a corporation is profitability. So Friedman had come up with that in the 1980s, but it didn't become widely adopted until the 1990s and widely in practice in the United States until the 1990s because of what the Business Roundtable was that they actually adopted that as the philosophy. And then that's when we got to things like, okay, Wall Street companies are gonna cut headcount just to be able to make that quarter look good. That's when we started getting into these like crazy dynamics of everything and sacrifice to the almighty dollar. And so now two years ago, what happened was the business round table again, because of these different you know, pressures, came back and said, we're changing the philosophy back, we're reverting back to what it was before we changed it in the 1990s. And now this, the philosophy is that corporates exist in order to be able to serve all stakeholders. So that means our external communities, our societies, our nations, each other, the world, as well as our internal employees. And I, and I know as hard as some things can feel right now for um, some of the immediate things and sometimes for some very specific organizations and sometimes for some very specific nations, but we are on this trajectory of moving together as a global force towards these, 20, these 2030 goals. And so the last piece on this is, so then, okay, what, you know, why does this matter? And what does it have to do with your opening statement about private companies and public companies? Well, there's been so much pressure now that the SEC has now made the requirement. So again, they've put, we people, external to organizations have put pressure on these regulatory bodies and these entities of influence to say, we care about what's happening with the environment. We care about what's happening socially with people. We care about what's happening with government and governance. And so the pressure came on the, from the institutional investors and shareholders about four years ago on the SEC to actually start reporting more, requiring public companies to report more than just the number of employees. So since 1934, that's it as far as whatever the people practices were to an organization in quarterly reporting and annual reports, the only thing that public companies in the United States have had to report on is the number of employees. And now starting Monday, they have to report on anything that's of material interest to the investors that has to do with business performance. And so if wealth creation is based off of leveraging the talent and the performance and the productivity and the innovation and human ingenuity of your workforce, and we know that it is, then anything that has to do with the material operations of the development, the management, and the performance of your people now has to be publicly reported as of Monday. Yeah, that that's excellent. I'm I'm glad to see that this is coming. This will bring some uh, structure to uh, social responsibility in some way yeah. to take a hard look at it. But are there any standard metrics for this that uh, people are gravitating towards? Yeah. So we've got so with the again with the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States with the SEC, they've taken a very principles based approach. And basically they're like, look, organizations need to put on their big girl pants and man up on this, where they should have an understanding, right? Like we should have an understanding of our internal operations about how it is 
how are we translating human resources into human capital, right? So human right. resources is kind of like the raw ingredients, if you will. And then human capital is the value creation or the wealth that's created because of it. Um, and so they're doing principles based because they can't be prescriptive. They can't say, well, if you're an organization like this, then you need to have these kinds of specific metrics. And so what that happens is, is that means that it then puts the onus of responsibility on the organizations to know enough about their own internal practices to be able to report effectively on what it is that they should be disclosing under the ruling. Mm -hmm. the, so then the, the parallel to that with the private companies is the banks have now looked at another financial institutions and private equity and they're like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, well, you know, uh, it's a different economic climate as of 2020. We've got a whole bunch of constriction that's not, you know, now happening actually because of the economic and financial crises that are happening around the world. We as banks need to be more judicious in how it is and who it is that we're lending money to. Who are we, you know, funding and, and yeah. providing financing for? So they're starting to it there as they're changing their lending requirements. We're starting to see these metrics come into play. So all of these forces that are converging, there's actually yet another one. And that has to do with the International Organization for Standards. We know them as ISO. And so ISO actually came out with the first human capital management reporting metrics and a standard back in 2018. So that, um, that standard is ISO 30414. Again, a global standard. It was created the same way that ISO has created standards for everything. I mean, you know, we can, I, I think of ISO in the business world, like I, I've worked in manufacturing before. So I think of like ISO 9000 or ISO 9001 in our quality handbooks. Like this is the same thing, but it's for human capital management. Yeah. And of course, all ISO standards are international and have been put together by working groups that represent different countries around the world. And it's also voluntary, right? So, but we have some countries where the culture, like Germany is a good example, where the culture is that if there's an international standard, especially something that's issued by ISO, they're adopting it. Yeah. Because why would you do anything? Why would you wing it? Why would you do anything else? And so what's happening now between the requirements with the SEC and the growing demand with the banks and the other on the, on the private side is that a lot of people are beginning or organizations are looking at the ISO 30414 standard and the metrics that are in there, at least as a starting point to guide their decisions on what to disclose. Excellent. Well, that's, um, it's good that they're standards and that they're, that they're published and accessible. I'll have to, I want to go check that out. Um, um, so, do you, I mean, do you know of these uh, standards that have been published? What, so what should a training manager, director, CLO, what should they be thinking about in terms of how, because they're not the only one that's going to be reporting uh, any of this, but what are the things that might be that they might need to look at to make sure that they have the systems in place to begin reporting it so it's not a fire drill every month? Well, and it's and it's about to be a fire drill, right? Because this is happening fast, and like nobody knows that this is even coming down the pike. So, mm -hmm. um, so to to you know, one of the things that you just said, which is really good, guy, was there's the external reporting, right? Like what needs to be disclosed to the outside stakeholders, and then what metrics need to be operationalized internally yeah. in order to be able to figure out what is your you know, and, and at any given point in time current indicator and leading indicators, like what's the forecast? Where yeah. are we? Mm -hmm. Because we're now reporting these target metrics. And again, the target metrics, and these things didn't, again, the ISO 30414, the UN sustainability goals, the national goals, the sustainability reports that corporations have started to do. This is like the first time that these things are sort of coming together and then evolving into, um, it's going to be, you know, sort of iterative. 
before we get into some of the specifics around some of the metric clusters and some of the metrics and the metric definitions and the measures, um, it would also be good for me to say, so you, and I'm not an attorney and not a financial advisor. And of course, this is not legal or financial advice. This is educational material that we're doing here in this conversation. But we, the, what is the risk, right? So if you do nothing at all, if people pay no attention to any of this, what is the potential risk? Well, the risk is not only regulatory, right? So not only can the SEC come after an organization that doesn't disclose appropriately, but shareholders can now sue you. And I, I'll give you a very specific example in just a moment here, but um, then the other piece to that is on the, on the private side is again, as the banks are restricting their, you know, their lending, and um, you know, again, other financial sources are changing their requirements and what it is that they expect to see, then the risk is, you know, we've got a lot of organizations that depend on financing over a period of time to finance right. their workforce and equipment and growth and, and all the rest of it. This is now not the time that you want to jeopardize your mm -hmm. um, financial means. So the specific metrics. Um, so in the ISO standard, there are 11 metric clusters. And so skills and capabilities is a cluster, diversity is a cluster, health, safety and wellness are a cluster. Um, so you can kind of see like where they're going. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the great resources that people can take a look at in addition to the actual ISO standard itself is of course the great work that David Vance and Peggy Parsky have been doing with the talent, uh, with the Center for Talent Reporting. Do you, you know about CTR no, and don't. TDRP? No. No, um, so they started, so David Vance, of course, was the one of the first chief learning officers ever and was the CLO at Caterpillar here in Illinois. Um, and he's had a passion for actually measurement and for metrics for a long time. And you know, that whole phrase of how do we run learning as a business, right? Um, and, and, and a side note real quick while I'm thinking about it, when we're talking about running learning as a business, people often translate that just into financial, but it's not just financial. It, the language of a business isn't just financial, it's also risk. Right. So and, and that's always how I frame just because of my background, I've always mm -hmm. framed things from the standpoint of risk. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do we do a risk analysis on. And so those are those are two domains that any organization is going to pay attention to is what are the financial implications and what's the risk. So, so David has had a focus on, because he was actually uh, an, uh, an economist for Caterpillar before he stepped into the CLO role. So he had you know, this um, financial uh, and has this financial savvy. So he and Peggy actually started the Center for Talent Reporting and actually got a bunch of um, different stakeholders together, organizations and like Jack and Patty Phillips from the ROI Institute and a bunch of different um, names that we would recognize were involved in setting up um, the Talent Development Reporting Principles, TDRP, about 10 years ago. And David was doing stuff for a while with um, the Human Capital Lab out of uh, Bellevue University. So the TDRP, the Talent Development Reporting Principles and the Center for Talent Reporting had been trying to pull together a definition of different metrics, like just to pull everything together not only specific to L and D, but also to across the employee life cycle, right? So mm -hmm. what are what are met, what are standard definitions? How do we begin to curate and then standardize on these things? And so David has actually been part of the working group in the United States in developing the ISO 30414 standard. So people should look at the standard, but they should also take a look at if they go to the Center for Talent reporting.org, they'll also find a wealth of information there from both Dave and um, Peggy as well. Uh, and so when you start to drill down into these clusters, then we get into the specific metrics and then we get into under the ISO standard and also under the TDRP, you get into like, okay, well, here's the metric, here's the definition of the metric, and then here's how the metric is measured across the industry, right? So then now we're not messing around with, well, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, 
and and this is really great internally too, especially for organizations that have you know um, different offices in different places where your business units or different offices are measuring differently or using different metrics. This gives an opportunity to start to clean all of that stuff up, and especially <laughs> against a global standard. Right. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Sounds a little bit like the Baldridge Award uh, in some respects, um, but the because they couldn't be prescriptive either. Um, but uh, this, is, this is excellent. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. So, what do you what do you what do you do in your business that supports this kind of thing? Do you help organizations, you know, assess uh, themselves against what they need to have in place right at this particular point in time? Well, I, yeah, um, kind kind of. So, um, so a couple of things. Uh, so a quick personal story, and then taking it into practical application and in, in how I work with people and how I work with organizations around this. So um, two quick stories. So I actually, when I was in a leadership position here with Chicago with uh, ASTD with with um, ATD's previous life, mm -hmm. um, I had a relationship. Um, uh, with, uh, of course, a number of people in the Chicagoland area and a number of universities. And we had, unfortunately, years and years ago, we had um, one of our uh, leaders at the chapter, Deb Kolke, passed away very, very suddenly. And, um, and Deb uh, was one of the first um, CPLP certified professionals in learning and performance. She was also the head of the graduate program for L&D at Roosevelt University, much beloved, well-loved, just a, a fabulous, a fabulous person. And actually all of my books around the CPLP uh, prep have been dedicated to Deb, um, to Deb and to, and to Carol Susan uh, Devaney. So, um, so what happened was I wound up because of Deb, her husband had started a, a scholarship fund and uh, to help a student who was studying in HRD or in L&D um, to have, you know, basically like $1,000 um, in the scholarship that would be uh, awarded through an application process. And so part of what I, you know, did like 10 years ago was I would go around to different universities. And so I'm very blessed that one of the universities that I have access to here in the Chicagoland area and actually not far from me now is Benedictine University. And Benedictine is the home of David Cooper Ryder. And David Cooper Ryder is the founder of Appreciative Inquiry. And so I've had the privilege of meeting David. I've had the privilege of meeting um, Peter Sorensen and Therese Yeager over at Benedictine as part of the business and organizational development practice. And David Cooper writer in Appreciative Inquiry is the facilitation that was used to come up with the 17 United Nations um, mm -hmm. Sustainability Development Goals. And so I was really excited that um, Anthony Dudek, who's one of the past presidents also of the local, the Chicago ATD chapter, was very kind to reach out to me a few years ago. And we went to go see um, David at uh, present on the sustainability goals and on what's happening with Appreciative Inquiry at Benedictine a few years ago. I also had the good fortune of being at Training Magazine at a, at a, at a summit. Um, and it was also kind of weird now that I think about it because bird flu was happening at the time. And so they mm. wound up having very low attendance because people didn't want to travel. But it was at a Training Magazine summit. This was back in 2009. And I just happened to randomly sit down at a table with some of the folks from the Human Capital Lab at Bellevue University that were working on putting intangible assets, people on the balance sheet. And so I started, so in my practice and with CPLP and all the rest of it, like we've been talking about the talent development reporting principles ever since Peggy and Dave got that started. And then what was happening at the Human Capital Lab for more than a decade now, because it was like, this is coming, you know, like we've been talking about the importance of how all of this stuff was coming. Um, so I love both the fact that we now have ways of being able to have some standard and consistency and some common language um, so that we can better communicate with each other and better advance people and places and organizations forward. But I'm also, it just warms my heart that this comes out of 
David Cooper writer's work in Appreciative Inquiry and a shout out to Mickey Lewis, also a past president in Chicago who got me into Appreciative Inquiry in the first place. So I love the fact that it's got these aspirational goals and then it's connected to real practical application of what we can do. So right now with, um, so I've been in this space of advising on these things with my clients in different shapes and forms um, for quite some time, uh, according to, you know, again, contextualized to whatever it is that they're trying to do. So a, a real quick example of how that plays out like with organizations right now is, um, here, and, and I'm, I'm not working with them on this, but, but to, give people an example. So Procter & Gamble, P&G, actually earlier this year in 2020 was actually making claims around diversity and inclusion, that they're a DNI workforce, that they, you know, that they are really big on diversity and so on and so forth. And there, and this was before the SEC announcement, their shareholders called them on it. So their shareholders went back and they said, hey, wait a minute, you're all over the media and these, you know, different public, you know, PR campaigns talking about that you have these hiring practices, but there's no substantive evidence of that. There's nothing in your annual report. There's nothing on your earnings calls. There's nothing in your quarterly reports that actually quantify what that actually means. Mm -hmm. And we want you to make good. And it's been this tug of war that's been happening all year and P&G has been resistant. Um, well, now, as of Monday. Yeah, they're going to have to. They're going to have to. So if we think about now as practitioners, right, in this space, what, what, what about our people in our workforce, are our executives and business leaders publicly talking about that now is going to have to be substantiated by some kind of information on the back end? If you're a private company that relies on funding, that relies on a credit rating, that relies on being able to have access to a line of credit or financing, what, what is the bank going to require? And so I work with uh, organizations around the world in, in having that kind of frame, usually embedded into a, a specific practice that they're trying to do um, or from an advisory kind of standpoint, right? So one of the things that I do, I, I can't work with everybody, right, on a consulting gig, but I do often work with organizations with an advisory where like I'll spend a day or two just walking them through, here's an idea of some of the initiatives that you have going on that you may think about should be part of this reporting. And then what kind of internal practices and controls are you going to need in order to be able to keep tabs on having, you know, are we making progress? What, it, you know, what, where are we actual to goal? What's the forecast? What are we predicting? How do we use data and technologies in order to be able to get those kinds of insights so that we can make sure that we are managing the people function, that we are managing people development, that we are, we are doing due diligence to our organizations, to our people, and now to these constituents, these stakeholders external to the organization that are demanding to have visibility into what has traditionally, of course, been very, very, very internal and behind the scenes kind of processes. The world is changing rapidly and and much for the better too so i'm very happy to hear about this any final words of wisdom uh that you'd like to share with uh, our audience on this topic well I, I i've done a lot of talking on this call guy and i i know that this is all new that you're you know like in our prep call like getting ready for this i was like well let's save it for the call let's save it for the call but I, I looked at, so what else is coming up for you as we, as we roll to, to kind of wrap up? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, so what I was concerned with, what I thought I should be concerned with is what are the implications to the L&D function? Now there's a reporting requirement. So where are they in that chain of data that's going to flow upward? And, and can they quickly, I didn't realize it was, you know, as of Monday, but um, so what yeah. they want to assure themselves that they have in place or that they can come up with some way to articulate some number, some score uh, or some set of, describe some activities 
um, but then fine tune that and get that down because this is a this is going to be an ongoing thing. This is not a one off. So you want to put in something there that's going to be effective and efficient in generating these numbers. And like all of these kinds of ISO systems and all that stuff, now you can compare and contrast yourself and see where you're improving and focus your uh, continuous improvement efforts so that you are going after things of strategic significance or operational significance and not going after all of these little sideshows. I often think about, uh, you know, no big uh, enterprise spends money on capital equipment without going through a horrendous approval process. And yet we spend huge amounts of money on human capital development, instruction, training, learning, and we're not held to any of those kinds of uh, uh, expectations. We don't, it's not governed uh, correctly in the first place. So these investments are made through some strange mechanism that's not necessarily good for the shareholders or for any of the other stakeholders. So, but that was my hope is that uh, what can, what can the, uh, what heads up can we give to the L&D managers, the directors, the chief learning officers, depending on the size of the firm in terms of what are they going to have to start reporting and how are they going to start doing that and have that ready to go on Monday? Otherwise, they're, they're, I'm sure there's minor consequences initially, but you know, you're going to have to get on board with this and start doing this. So the, the very first thing that I would do is I would find out what your organization is already doing, right? So is your organization, if you're a publicly traded company, your organization is already publishing a sustainability report, which has people metrics in it. But they're, again, they're more aligned to what's happening with the UN and they're more broader people like the community and sort of the workforce in general. But a lot of people are not even aware that their companies are reporting anything at all about their people. So go take a look at that. The second thing is, is what are your competitors reporting, right? Are your competitors reporting anything in their sustainability reports? What are they reporting in their... Um, so, and, and let me not get this, let me not confuse people here. Sustainability reports have been voluntary and have been directly aligned to national strategy and the UN global goals. Now on the 10 Ks and the 10 Qs with the SEC in the annual reports and then quarterly reports, public traded companies listed on the stock exchange in the United States as of Monday will have to have different metrics, but they're related, right? You can get kind of a sense, but then now this is, again, anything material to talent management, talent attraction, talent development, anything in the employee life cycle or talent, because it's not just employees, it's any, your contingent workers, you know, um, so get familiar. What is your organization reporting on right now? What are your competitors reporting on? And if you're at an organization like a private company or you're at an organization that hasn't started reporting even sustainability goals and you don't really know like your competitors or it's not really a competitor doing that, if you wanna get at least some of a sense, take a look at one of your utility companies. Like just, you know, whomever you're using as a consumer, right? In order to have, you know, power and electric or whatever at home, they have sustainability reports and some of them may already be reporting on their annual on their annual reports um, people metrics so that'll at least give you an idea of what it looks like because it's not just the numbers it's the narrative too you're telling just like finance has to tell the story like why were our quarterly earnings not so great and they have to have a narrative that goes along with it no one's looking for perfection on the people side either but they want to know like do you know and if you do know, what are you doing about it? What is the corrective action? What is the plan? And how did, you know, how did this happen? Because not only is it going to have to be in print, but it's also going to wind up in investor relation presentations, public companies. Like this is stuff that's now going to get pushback on uh, investor calls, right? So anytime that they're doing anything with quarterly earnings or that kind of stuff, your CEO and CFO are going to have to ask questions or answer questions now to the public about your practices with talent internal to the organization. So then the fourth thing with that is 
if you're making an investment or have recently made an investment to your point guy, like in one of these big technology platforms, those days of dropping a quarter of a million dollars on a multi-year contract with a learning management system or insert whatever technology here are gone. They're officially done. Because if you can't now do a readout and have the internal processes, not on the efficiency of that system, but on the efficacy and the impact of that system to drive some kind of specific business performance and people outcome, you're not, you're, you're going to get a lot of pushback, uh, number one. And, and number two, let's say that I, I just really want people to sort of connect with what the potential risks are. Again, risk. Let's say that you make this big investment. Let's say that your organization's business strategy is to here's a here's a very pandemic-y kind of thing. Let's say that I, you know, your organization's business strategy is now to move supply chain from some other country back to in here, you know, North America, right? Right. So you're gonna move it back to North America. Well, great. You're going to have to staff up, you know, what's your workforce planning, what's your talent strategy, and so on and so forth for this new location that you're going to move these core operations to. Well, great. You're going to have an onboarding program for this new workforce. You're going to have management training. You're going to have employee training. You're going to have compliance training. Your investors now have legal access to how you're managing that and the decisions that you make. So if you're like an L&D exec and you go, okay, well, we're going to drop again, quarter of a million dollars, whatever, whatever the amount on, but a significant amount of money on whatever kind of platform or tool to help enable getting that workforce to be able to perform and produce in that business strategy, you're now going to have to, to defend or not even defend, because defend is not the right word. We have to get used to now answering questions about if it's working how do we know if it's not working how do we know and what are we what are we doing about it so nobody's expecting 100 percent excellent excellence but they expect you to know where things are at and i i heard a quote recently and i don't remember unfortunately who it was but it was like if you don't know where you are you're lost <laughs> like you're lost right so yeah. So this is the whole thing in this, like you, and this, you don't want to show up in front of your board. You don't want to show up in front of senior leadership. You don't want to show up in front of your shareholders or in consumers. You don't want, you know, one of your people out on an analyst call or, you know, on TV and they're lost about what's happening with the people practices internal to the organization. That is not going to be a good look. And the, and the big risk is not only, you know, being made a redundant almost immediately, but the big risk here is if we're not doing it as L&D people, somebody else in the organization is going to have to. And the minute that you learn, the minute that you lose control of either being a player in a major stakeholder in the external reporting and even worse yet, the internal operations and the internal processes and control, you're you're done. Your your days at your team, your function, your career at that organization is toast. And we're gonna. This isn't gonna be a slow roll. Like oh, we'll just wait and see, and we'll see what everybody else does over the next year or so. No, they've been pushing for this for years, and now that they have it our shareholders and other, again, external stakeholders are going to exercise their ability to hold that stick. Yeah, I mean, they're gonna have visibility to uh, financially where the money goes and the explanations, the narrative as to, you know, what's going on. Um, but maybe it's, it makes me, I keep circling back to the Baldridge because the Baldridge had some pretty good uh, metrics in place and some structured su suggestions, but I, I, it's been a long time since I looked at any of that stuff, but, uh, but this is going to be good that we begin to ask about our, you know, human development practices and what are we doing and are we improving? I mean, that's the whole goal of systems like this is you put standards in place and you can flex those standards and evolve them over time as necessary, but you need to provide some structure. Otherwise everybody's doing their own thing and, 
and no one can learn from each other because we're, we're not talking the same language. We don't have the same uh, fr mental frameworks, mental models that we can work on. But uh, Trish, yeah. Yeah. thank you so much for uh, sharing all of this with us today. I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm looking to have you back and to talk about more interesting things. Yay cake. I love it. Thanks so much, Guy. Thanks for having me. Everybody all be right. well. All right. Thank you, Trish. Bye-bye.